Alright, do you remember when we said that your IP address is kind of like your home address? It tells the internet where you live, but knowing where the house is doesn't get you inside. For a hacker or a legitimate service to get data into your computer, they need to find an opening. They need to find a door. In networking, these doors are called ports, and if I remember correctly, there are 65,535 of them available on your computer right now. And have in mind that every single one of them is a potential way in or out of your computer. But the way I like to think about it is as if it was this massive apartment complex where every tenant is just a different application. When you open your browser to watch YouTube, your computer isn't just connecting to the internet magically, it's actually opening a specific door. Web traffic, for example, uses port 80 for unsecure web and port 443 for secure web. If you play Minecraft, you just know the server lives at port 25565, I mean, that's just a classic. And if you're more of a nerd and use SSH to control a server remotely, that's port 22. And look, I'm not gonna try and act all tough like I already knew all of these when I first started because it took me a while to memorize most of them. But don't be intimidated by them because you don't gotta learn all the ports there are, just the most important ones and you'll be cool. And there's this little detail I've seen most tutorials skip and it's something I like to call the two doors concept. When you connect to Google for example, Google is listening on the port 443 and that's their door, but you're computer needs a door to receive the answer, just stay with me now. In this case, you don't use port 443 for this, you use what we call an ephemeral port. Here, your computer randomly picks a high number, say port 53241, opens it for a split second, grabs the data from Google, and then slams it shut. This actually matters because malware often hides in these high ports. A rat, for example, might hide on port 44444, hoping you think it's just a random browser tab. Matter of fact, we can actually see this right now in the terminal. The only problem problem is that I'm on a Windows VM and I hate this terminal. So instead of hopping onto my main system like any sane person would do, I'm just gonna install a Linux terminal inside this Windows VM because why not? So all I'm gonna do is just type WSL dash dash install reboot the VM and that's it. Magic. First, type netstat. You will see a list of listening and established connections. Listening means that a door is unlocked, waiting for someone to walk in. Established means someone is already inside, and most of them are harmless, but hackers are looking for the ones that are not. Back in the day, we used protocols like Telnet in port 23 to talk to computers. Telnet is great, except it sends everything on plain text. So if you leave port 23 open today, you aren't just leaving the door unlocked, you're taking the door off the hinges and putting a sign that says free stuff inside. Side. And here's a fun fact for you, hackers use bots that scan the entire internet 24-7 just looking for that specific port number, if they find it they don't even need to be good at hacking, they just walk in. But knowing the door number is only half the battle, you also need to know the special handshake that gets the door to open, this is where we get into TCP versus UDP and I guess ICMP was there too. Think of TCP as that incredibly anxious friend who needs confirmation for literally everything. It's reliable, but man is it annoying. It always does this thing called the three-way handshake, let me explain. It always goes like this, computer A sends a packet with a flag called synchronize, and it says, hey man, are you open? Computer B then replies with synac, which basically means it just says, yeah, I'm here, you good? And finally, computer A replies with ac, which just says, yeah, cool, I'm sending files now. It confirms every single packet, it even numbers them. If you send for example 100 packets and packet number 42 gets lost in the cable under the ocean, TCP screams, stops the entire connection and resends packet number 42. This is why websites load correctly, I mean you don't want a bank transfer to arrive with missing zeros just because the internet high copped, that's what TCP is for and it ensures perfection. And then you have the maniac. UDP is like a delivery driver who drives by your house at 50 miles per hour then throws the package through the window without stopping. He doesn't care if you're home, he doesn't care if the package hits your cat, he doesn't even care if you're subscribed. Which is awful because if you want to learn more about cybersecurity, I recommend you doing so but anyways. When you play a shooter for example and lag, that's a UDP packet getting lost. The game doesn't stop to ask for it again because in a real time fight, information from 2 seconds ago is useless, you're already dead. So 
the game just ignores the packet like it never existed and moves on, just like your ex. And briefly, we also have ICMP, which isn't for sending data, but for diagnosis. This is what you use when you type ping, for example. It's just poking at the other computer to see if it's alive. This can also be used maliciously, as hackers use this to map out networks before they even try to connect to a port, because if a computer replies to a ping, we know it exists. Now, all of this, ports, TCP, UDP, relies on your computer finding the other computer in the first place. And humans are stupid. We are terrible at remembering numbers. If I told you to connect to 142.250.190.46 right now, you wouldn't do it, I wouldn't do it, no one would do it. But if I say go to google.com, then even your grandma would do it. This translation from human name to robot number is handled by a domain name system. It is literally the phone book of the internet. Every time you type a URL, your computer secretly whispers to a DNS server, hey, where is YouTube? And the server replies with the IP address. But every computer has a file called the hosts file. It's like a post-it note on your monitor that overwrites the phone book. And boy, let me tell you, malware just loves this file. A virus can write a line in your host file that says this. You type the real address, your computer checks the notes first, ignores the DNS, and sends you straight to the hacker servers. It's it's the oldest trick in the book and it still works because nobody checks that file. Also I should tell you that by default you're using your internet service provider's DNS and usually it sucks. It's slow, it often censors sites and it even locks every single domain you visit to sell that data to advertisers. A lot of privacy conscious people, usually the ones who are subscribed by the way, switch their DNS to something like Cloudflare or Google because it's faster and in Cloudflare's case it's more private. I mean it's basically trading a dusty old phone book for a high high-speed digital index. However, DNS is also a massive weak point because there's an attack called DNS spoofing. Boy, let me brace myself for this one. Imagine if I broke into the phone book company and out of all people changed your mom's phone number to my phone number. You naively pick the phone, you dial mom, and then I answer. That's right, it was me, Barry. In the digital world, a hacker can trick your computer into thinking that Facebook.com is located at the hacker's IP address. You type the correct URL, you see the correct logo, you type your password, but just handed your credentials to a server in a basement in Russia. This brings us to the final layer of defense. How do we trust that the site is real? How do we stop the mailman from reading our letters? That is where HTTPS and SSL certificates kick in. In the old days of HTTP, everything was sent in plain text. I I'm not kidding. If I was sitting in the same coffee shop as you, sniffing the Wi-Fi traffic with a tool like Wireshark, and you logged into a website, I could literally see this. It was that easy. That's why HTTPS was born. The S stands for secure. It wraps your traffic in a layer of encryption called TLS. Now, if I sniff your traffic, I don't see password 1 to 3. I see a gavel mess of random characters. And I mean, I know you're talking to the bank. I know how long you've been talking to the bank, I just have no idea what you're saying. But encryption is basically useless if you're talking to the wrong person. This is where certificates come in. When you see that little lock icon right now, your browser is checking the digital ID card presented to the website. Then a trusted authority checks if that is really Google. If the ID is fake, your browser gives you that giant red warning screen. Please do not ignore that screen, it's there for something. It usually means someone is trying to intercept your connection. I've seen people walk right through it, like with my own eyes, it just makes me want to die. But, and this is a big but, encryption doesn't protect you if the server itself is malicious. If you connect securely via HTTPS to a scam site, you're just securely sending your money to a scammer. So, let's bring all of this together. How does a hacker actually use this info against you? Well, they don't guess, they scan. I'm going to show you using Nmap. Nmap is a tool we're gonna use to knock on every single one of those sweet 65,000 doors. Take a look at this. I'm adding the B flag for verbose mode so it talks to us, and SB is critical to detect versions. I hit enter and the screen just lights up. See that? We immediately found that port 22 was open along with port 80, but while the final table loads, I want you to tell me what these ports are for. You have 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, time stop it for this. Now that the final table is up, I want you to look at it. 
and now look closer it doesn't just say open it gives me the damn version and this is just jackpot because as a hacker i don't attack poor 80 i attack this so i take that number go to a vulnerability database and see that that version is from 2013 so i don't need to guess the password i just want an exploit from an old version and suddenly i'm root so what i want you to understand about this is that hackers don't guess they look for open doors you forgot about and old rusty locks you forgot to change and look i know i just throw a lot of information at you so in the description there are gonna be resources that i left so you can research more deeply on these topics and remember to never stop learning because one day i know you'll be better than me with this stuff